Welcome to another episode of It's a Long Road, the Rambo Series podcast. I'm your host, Ryan, and with me today, returning guest host from Season 1, uh, John, you made the cut. John Rivoli, how you doing? <laughs> it's so good to know. I still got it. Still get through the summer you know, training before football. It's great. <laughs> John, it's always a pleasure and an honor to talk to you, um, one, because of your friendship, two, because of your your talent and uh, your art, your artistry and your talent. I'll always love your posts on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter where you share your wonderful artwork. And for maybe those who are listening to this season who didn't listen to the first season, why don't you just uh, describe what it is that you do? I work for all the film studios on different film and television projects in an art capacity, creating artwork to either promote the property or further give it life through, you know, consumer products uh, well after something is out of the theaters or off TV. And through that world, I, I made my way over to Sylvester Stallone and became the official Rocky and Rambo artist for him. So I, um, I started an online gallery called Icons and Art, and that's where I put up all my pieces as I finish them, and I work very closely with Sly on every piece that I do. He he has to uh, have a say and approve every one before they come out. That's awesome. That is really so cool. And on our last episode that we did together, you revealed a piece of artwork to me, which I loved, of course, regarding Rambo's last kind of monologue in the film where he breaks down with his full PTSD and what have you and he revealed that piece of artwork and you showed it to Sly. Why didn't you say what Sly's reaction was to that piece? Yeah, he his initial response back was utterly fantastic. <laughs> Which, you know, to hear that from Sly, first of all, but also an amazing artist in his own right on so many levels. You know, just for an artist to validate uh, a piece of work that you've done really means a lot. So, yeah, he really, really liked how deep I went into that piece. Oh, it's amazing. That's awesome. In fact, I just sent him a new piece. So I have right now 18 new pieces of art ready to release at the end of the summer. Uh, I usually wait till the fall and I send them over to him. And one of them, he just made his uh, wallpaper on his phone. Oh wow! Which was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was pretty cool. That is that is really cool. Now we said on our last episode that we recorded during season one of the show that you, well, we joked about it, but I don't think you've done this. But maybe I'll just remind you. Maybe you've forgotten about asking him if you could take a little piece of that canvas from First Blood and see if you could paint on it. Did you talk to him about that? I didn't. I actually it slipped my mind. I'm glad you're reminding me because I could ask him if he has it. You know, see if he still has the thing. It would be great to to do something on that. All right, so before we get going here, John, I hope you can indulge me a little bit. I do have a piece of mail that I would like to read and you can certainly comment on it with me afterwards. This is from a listener. He goes, "Uh, hi Ryan, I've recently started listening to your podcast. I constantly had first blood playing on a loop during the mid 80s, but I haven't watched it in such a long time, so I've decided to watch some of it this evening. He goes, in episode five, you mentioned Rambo taking Galt's jacket but him never wearing it or seeing it again. Could this jacket be what they think is Rambo had the dogs sicked on him and there's that scarecrow set up with that jacket? I thought that too, that that might be Galt's jacket, but it, the jacket that the scarecrow is using in the forest scene, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, I do. yeah, but it didn't look like the jacket that he pulled. Now, maybe it's supposed to be, but it just I just actually watched First Blood yesterday with my kids for the first time. My younger kids haven't seen it yet, and they loved it. So it's funny that we're yeah. talking about this, because I watched that scene because of this email. We like, really watched it, and it just doesn't yeah. look like the same jacket. Maybe it was supposed to be, but it just didn't actually look like the same jacket. To go back and kind of give that a deep look as well, so I could comment intelligently on it, but... I would defer to you. I mean, you know it as well as anybody. I would just assume that it was probably supposed to be the same jacket. Like, I mean, the script probably called for it, but the prop department maybe dropped the ball on making it look like the same jacket. Yeah. It happens all the time. Yeah, of course. He says here that also when Teasel is at the top of the cliff and shoots down at Rambo and he appears to be injured, I'm wondering if a ricochet or stone hits him in the head. As the next time we see him, he's wearing his red or his headband for the first time. So is this Rambo patching himself up? That's interesting. 
That's the first. So he puts that up. Oh, yeah. He, well, that would make sense, wouldn't it? That he did something to himself because of what happened there. That's why I put the iconic headband on. And that might fall into the, one of the many deleted scenes that we never see. So that could have been filmed, but slide deleted it. Yeah, because we know there's a right. three-hour cut. And yeah, I know. Because we don't see it happen, like we don't see blood from his head or we don't see any of that kind of stuff, I'm still going to lean towards he faked the injury. It suits him trying to show his hunters that he's injured, but he's not, mm-hmm. which makes him seem like more vulnerable, which would slow their role trying to find him. Because they did seem more relaxed. They're like, oh, he's injured, da da da. Right. He says here just a couple of things I've picked up on watching it this evening. I've probably never watched as closely as I have after listening to your podcast. Yeah, we seem to have that effect on people. We, <laughs> when we do these podcasts, people are like, I never thought of that. I never looked. Oh, that's the whole point, right? We, we do, a deep, do a deep dive. Yeah. He goes on to say, keep up the good work. Since discovering the network, it seems like I'm have a, I am have a lot of catching up to do. All the best, Ash. So thank you, Ash. We appreciate the emails from our listeners. Very nice. If you would uh, like to send us an email, just check out the show notes. But I think from my memory, it's just Rambo Series Podcast at gmail.com. So we appreciate that. That's great. It's good that you're getting people to take a closer look at something. You don't want to just cruise past a great painting in a museum. You want to stop. Kind of take a look, step, move around it, kind of take in all angles of it. So it's really nice that you're doing that for the films. Oh, thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. What we're doing right now, for those who are listening, we are recording what's called Discord. Discord is free. People can join our chat. We've got a couple of our listeners right now, John, in the chat. So they might interact or throw us a couple chat questions. I will read those out if and when they happen. So we appreciate those who are joining us in Discord. If you'd like to join the live discussions so you can hear things live and you don't have to wait for the recordings. You get to see us live. You get to see the mistakes we make with the um, mechanical or technical difficulties that can happen during a recording that I edit out for iTunes, but you get to watch it live when it happens. Some people get a kick out of that. <laughs> Before we start rolling into the film piece that we're going to review today, John, why don't you talk about, you know, listen to your first episode with First Blood. Of course, you've mentioned your love of Sly and the Ramble films in general, but we talked about First Blood. Now, this is Ramble First Blood Part 2. What's your overall history or feeling of the second film in the Ramble franchise? Well, this falls into a time in my life where it was kind of my heyday. It was high school, 1985, which was a great year for me. Everything was happening. And uh, I saw this in the movies, you know, which was nice because I didn't get to see First Blood, but I got to see this one in the theaters. And what a great year it was because you had this and then you had Rocky IV. Right. So Sly was on top of his game in 85. So if you were a Sly fan, 85 was a great year. And, uh, and I still remember seeing this film in the theater. I remember which theater it was. I remember who I was with. I remember everything about it because, you know, the 80s also were, were a great time. And they were a very patriotic time here in the U.S., let me tell you, between Rambo and Top Gun. And there was just a lot of good flag-waving stuff going on. So it was fun to be growing up during that time. Rambo just really put an exclamation point on that and became just part of our pop culture. And this was really the one where we took notice of the physique, too, of Sly, of what was going on here, and that we were all going to really go out and try and strive to get and, of course, never achieve, but we were going to go for it. Sure. Yeah, he inspired a lot of people to work out for I mean, that's... That's what he does. That's what he's done. That's what Sly continues to do at the age of 76. Can you believe he's 76? No, I can't believe it. I mean, he looks amazing. Look at him in those posts. I mean, the guy's diesel. It's just, it's incredible, you know? And yeah, I did a post about that this week. We talk about the great inspiration he's been for film. We sometimes overlook that. He got a whole generation into working out. My generation, we all became workout junkies because of Sylvester Stallone. You know, we just wanted to look like him. You got pipes on you. I, I don't, so I'm not gonna flex. I uh, I, I I stay healthy. I I, yeah. follow, I follow the uh, the sly code of you know living a healthy life. I jog. That's my big exercise. I'm a jogger and I eat healthy, but I don't I don't have muscles, as they say. And what an influence one man has really had. When you think back, and we look back at the legacy of Sly, there's a lot that he brought to this rock that we spin around on. Let me Absolutely. just tell you, a lot. <laughs> now, before we get into this, some of this uh, deep dive of the scene, did you review the scene that we're on approximately? Minute 54, right? Torture scene? It was when he uh, the helicopter takes off on him with the uh, POW. Oh, okay. Well, 
Well, for me, 54 was oh, uh, oops. Oh. the torture scene, which is too bad because I <laughs> it's too bad. bad. That's okay. Um, what what number did I give you? That is weird. Yeah, I've got 54 minutes of mine here on Netflix, but maybe it's whatever. The good news is we watch it together anyways, and it's not yeah. it's not Shakespeare. I'm sure you're going to be able to crack wise with me on it regardless. We'll go over the scene of him in just a second, but he's with Ko. Now, of course, Ko is his Vietnamese contact on the ground uh, here, and she's a uh, helping, of course, uh, the U.S. government. But a couple of little side things here. Now, I'm re- actually reading... Right now, David Morrell's novelization of this film. And this was kind of a unique situation because we know David Morrell, the creative Rambo, who wrote the first book, Rambo dies at the end of the first book. Right. And the studio approached David Morrell saying, hey, we're doing a second film. We would love to have your... Because novelizations of screenplays were very popular in the 80s and 90s. You probably remember that. Yeah. Sure. Before DVDs and Blu-ray and streaming, novelizations of films were kind of like candy for moviegoers because it gave people behind the scenes extra footage so to speak for the mind they're not quite as popular today they still happen but they were quite popular back in the day so you would have movies like first blood robocop tombstone those type of films had novelizations that kind of expanded on the screenplay remember all the star wars ones oh yeah well absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. rambo was a unique situation because david morale the author and creator were like well i already wrote the first book and the guy died you know know. (laughs) at the beginning of part two he wrote rambo dies in my book but lives in the film (laughs) so that's how he started it and then he just went into rambo part two yeah so that's how he worked around that but interesting he gives us what he used this might be just to my listeners is that he used three things to create the novel one the shooting script which we see on film Mm -hmm. two james cameron's script that was not shot on film. And so he actually had in his possession James Cameron's proposed script. Wow. And then his own, of course, authorship yeah. to tie everything together and give us the backdrop of Sly and some of the characters and what have, or sorry, Ramble and some of the characters. So I say that because Co in the book, and you could argue it's also in the film, it's just we don't see it. There's no reason to believe it's not it's not happening. That Co in the book, she's about 30, and she has a 12-year-old son, and she's a widow. Hmm. And her son lives in the States. Oh. The, the U.S. government was saying, if you help us out, we'll get you connected with your son. Okay. Yeah. But the biggest piece of information, back to Cohen Rambo. So Rambo, of course, noticed Cohen and saw that she was attractive. And then he starts talking about his time in the war in his head and how he was called a rapist. And he says that, you know, he was disgusted by that accusation because he says that being in war and being in the situations, not only does it destroy your... Like you don't want to rape people, it actually destroys your almost your sexuality. It don't, it destroyed the sex drive for him. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. The people that did commit those crimes were just as many people committing those atrocities at war as they would have at home. So if you yeah. had the proclivity to sexually assault somebody at home before the war, yeah, you just saw it as a free pass to do it. Exactly. But I find this interesting. Rambo, according to David Morrell, the creator of the character, is a virgin. Wow. And, you know, when you think about it, that might not be so surprising. You know, I mean, the guy's a recluse, and he didn't become a recluse in his adult life. He must have lived this his whole life, just been, you know, on his own, a lone wolf. Kind of would make sense. I don't see him opening up to many people in any way. Yeah, he did Hmm. have a girlfriend before he joined the military. So he joined right out of high school, but he never consummated that young relationship with this girl. He went to Vietnam... And when he came back, she had married and had a couple kids. So that's when he went on to then his traveling city to city, wow. town to town. So yeah. he did have a first love, but it, she met somebody else while he was serving his country. That's part of his, I don't say anger, but his recklessness. It's like, okay, I have nobody now. And it's just another piece of the puzzle yeah. falls into place. Mm-hmm. Put that on Twitter. Wow. A lot of people were like, oh, yeah, but there's a deleted scene in First Blood where he was with a prostitute. I'm like, okay. Yeah, apparently there's some deleted scene on the DVD footage where he was in the whorehouse, the, the character. But I don't know if that scene actually shows the consummation. And I also argue it's a deleted scene canon. And also the, the creator of the character says he's a virgin. I'm going to give that to David Morrell. Yeah, I would absolutely defer to the creator for what, what he is or not. What they did on set to kind of mess around with the idea of Rambo is a different story than the guy who created it is telling you what the character is. Exactly. 
All right, so uh, the part we're in the film now, so, uh, for our listeners, is Rambo has gone in to take photos. Of course, he lost his equipment, so he wasn't able to take photos. And actually, this is very important because this just happened in the podcast that we're doing and the last scene that we covered. When Rambo went to the camp, the POW camp, and when he was ordered to take pictures, I know a lot of the film goers think that he poo-pooed the idea, like, oh, I'm not going to just take photos. Again, the book clarifies that Rambo had every intention of following those orders because Rambo values orders above all else. He will do things that he doesn't oh, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that for the torture scene. I, I, oh, I okay. do that because I have a lot of information about that scene from talking to Sly. Uh, well, if you want to give that at the end of this, just like a, a couple tidbits and we can carry that over because that's going to be after this is his capture. And I apologize for yeah. giving you the wrong timestamp. I'm not sure how that happened. I apologize. It's okay. It just may be different for Netflix or the DVD too. It might be. It yeah. might line up a little differently with an intro or something. A couple of minutes throws the whole thing off. You know, when you come on again, John, I am going to make sure I tell you the exact scene where like the physical yeah. scene, not just the timestamp. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is like two for two now where I effed up. I apologize. Okay. Uh, Rambo wanted to take photos. I mean, he would have taken photos. Had he had the camera, he would have taken photos. Now, if he saw this prisoner that he has with him right now still hanging on a tree, he probably would have grabbed him. But in the book, he didn't have the camera, or in the movie, he doesn't either because it got lost. But I just want to make that clear that he had no intention of going Rambo, so to speak, and just exposing mm-hmm. himself in the mission. He wouldn't sacrifice the mission that way because by showing himself to be a con, he's now exposing the U.S. intention of rescuing these prisoners. Right, the whole mission. Mm-hmm. That's right. But he saw a prisoner. He had to grab him. Another side note is the prison that these prisoners are in, it could work in this film. It's not really shown in this film. But in the what I guess it was James Cameron's script, it was actually the same prison that Rambo was in. Oh. And that's why he knows it so well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And secondly, the guy that kind of is the leader that we'll see, the Vietnam Kong army guy that's the leader of this group, even though it's played by a different actor, again, in the book or in the screenplays that uh, David drew from, David Morrell, it's actually the same guy that tortured Rambo. Wow. So that's why when Rambo later, we'll get to it, but when he later gets his comeuppance on that guy later in the film, that's what makes it so yeah, it's, wonderful. It's is, more satisfying. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think we're all caught up. <sighs> Go on from here. You better I stay till end. This is the end. Come on, let's go. Mambo, you're not expendable. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Wait till 2010, and I will be. <laughs> <laughs> I know Sly could have possibly known when you when he because uh, he also had a hand in the screenplay too with this film. I think he wrote a lot of the dialogue that we see in here. But can you imagine if he was just that good that he knew that he'd be a part of the experience? <laughs> yeah, no. No, but it's just unbelievable how you, you just look at it and say, well, you know, the heavens are always shining down on certain people. Or, John, this maybe is a question you could ask him. Don't do it for me. I, I say this, and I, should, I shouldn't have word like this. John asked for me, but if you wanted to, and the thought ever occurred to you, one, the canvas, so remember that one. Two, yeah. ask him when he titled his franchise, The, the Expendables, did he remember this in fact yeah it was that kind of a nod to the rambo film that he helped co-write or was it just maybe again that it just happened he said oh my goodness you know there's only so many words in the english dictionary sure that he just happened to repeat the same but the idea that you have this sylvester stallone being told by a character hey you're not expendable then yeah 2010 he creates a franchise the expendables (laughs) so at this point cohen's Rambo have departed and Rambo's gone with uh, he's going to the extraction point so what we're seeing here is now Rambo literally has proof that we have prisoners of war so he's like in his mind he's like hey I've got what I need to tell the CIA the spook Murdoch I've got this guy look at this image by the way look at him see how he stops to look back at her oh yeah that's an important little moment right there that he's 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 taken off with the POW but he stops to take one last look at her so there's Something deeper there. Oh, yeah. They're smitten with each other. Absolutely. There's yep. a connection. You see it? Yeah. Yep. Hmm. If there's any scene here that you would like to paint, I mean, it doesn't mean you will, but again, I, I, with your artist background, if there's something like, oh, I kind of like that moment, like that scene, if I had to paint anything from this moment, let me know. I have one I think would be good in my mind for you, and yeah. but I would like to hear what you would like to paint. Okay. Sure.
so this guy here. That's the leader? Yeah, so that's the leader that Rambo spots in the camp, and Rambo makes a comment in his mind in the book. He's like, I can't believe that guy is still here. So it's acknowledged in the book that that gentleman's still at this posting at the prison yeah. camp, and he realizes, oh, this guy must have effed up somewhere in his time to be kind of still in hell as he sees it. And then he goes, mm -hmm. goes I'll make sure that his stay there is even... I'll give him a come up later or something like that. Like, yeah. Rambo wants to extract revenge on this guy, but he won't do it to sacrifice the mission just yet. So we got a great sequence here of Vicon doing that rocket launcher stuff where they put the warhead inside the little pipe, poof, pops yep. up like that. I don't know why I'd find that job scary. The guy that puts in the armament in, in, uh, in those rocket launchers, get your hand or face in the way. Of course, it's like the guy who has to light the fuse. You know, everybody else is always behind something and you got to go up and light it. Yeah, it's that's that guy. Ugh, scary. So Rambo's running through the uh, farm fields there. I guess, is that a rice field maybe? Are those rice fields? Probably the rice fields or something, yeah. Yeah, explosions going all around him and the prisoner. He's got him by the hand, so he's pretty much dragging this guy to the extraction dragging point. This guy, yeah. So I really like the action sequence here of the helicopter kind of going like full speed, trying to get to the extraction point right on time. There. Yep. It's great tension building. You're seeing the, all the different things happening simultaneously, and you're hoping that they all converge at the right moment so that we get him out. Yeah, absolutely. So the time is of the essence. Yep. And what I like is the helicopter, the pilot, uh, Erickson, he's flying like he's, he's doing the mission. I like he's a mission guy. He actually is doing yeah. the mission. He's getting there, getting there fast. We'll right. see what happens later, but uh, yeah. Oh. Ah. And I want to say, too, those are great aerial shots of the helicopter because it's going below the tree line. So there's another aircraft. Of course, there's no drones back then. So there's another right. aircraft filming the aircraft. So you got the yeah. helicopter going through and going below the tree line with another aircraft filming it. So it's actually really cool stunt work by the aircraft. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Luckily, those weapons aren't very accurate. Yeah, I don't know how accurate those... You, just, you know, you just drop it and hope it lands somewhere near it. <laughs> well, I guess they have some sort of like... The, he's a moving target, so it's probably, it is probably hard to aim. So to be fair to yeah. the, uh, you know, the bad guys always miss model yeah. for films. But I guess to aim those things, you got a moving target, and he's zigzagging himself, like Ramble's kind of zigzagging, making himself a hard target. You're right, so how do you change those rocket things just to match yeah. where he may or may not be? It's so they're getting close. It's like throwing a football. That's Rambo! Christ, he's found one. I do love that where Troutman's like, he can't believe it. He's found yeah. one. And he's got it, one. And in his mind, he's probably like, well, that is my Rambo. Like, of course he has one. Mm -hmm. But even he's a little bit bewildered by the fact that he's he's got one. Yeah. So Rambo gets a little bit of hope here. He sees the copter. Here's the gunfire. He sees that the American chopper is, is taking out Vicon. And he's got some air coverage. It's great. So he starts making his climb. Think about, think about how different visually this is from Rambo Part 4. When they're mowing these guys down, you just kind of see them fall. I'm not even seeing blood. There's a couple little squibs. You can see a couple squibs. Yeah, a little bit. In Rambo 4, they're, they're chopped in half. Like, they're just... <laughs> <laughs> They're literally just chopped in half the bodies. Like, oh my god. He did amp up the violence a little bit in part uh, four. <laughs> Ramble the character to slow motion. It's almost like a, a bad dream. You know when you're like trying to run from a bad yeah, guy? Yeah, you're stuck in mud. He's literally stuck in mud. So it's a nightmare. What they're visually creating is a nightmare 
for you. Oh my God, I'm running like I'm in mud. I can't get away from the killer. That's exactly what this is. Yeah. So he's slow, and not only is he in mud, but they've slowed the film down to show like the slow motion. Like yeah. he can't get up there, so everything is slowing down. But right. the, but the action around him is still going like high speed, full speed. Yeah. yeah. One of ours. Mr. Murdoch, Dragonfly reports the ground crew has what appears to be an American POW with him. What did you say? They've got one of ours. This uh, communicator guy's like, hey, they got him. Like, Ramble, third sight, and he actually has the POW with his rescue. Ones. He's got one of ours. He's got one of our guys. He's so excited. But Murdoch, not so much. Yeah. But I love how he just goes, what did you say? Yeah, because that was not the intention of why he's there to begin with. So this, this is a real wrench thrown into the mix here. Hey. The station's on condition Bravo. Fires Harrison, good on. Everybody, help! Come on, move! What are your comment priority frequency? Give him the mic. So he's kicked everybody out that's going to be a witness to what he's about to say uh, out of the room, except for the two radio guys. So everyone's been kicked out. It's Operation Bravo or whatever that was. Cold word to empty out the room. I'm going to have a conversation that I need to have as private as possible. Yeah, because I want to co- cover up. Dragonfly, this is Coach One. This is an Alpha Kilo Victor Command Priority. I want you to abort the mission immediately. I say again, this is a recall. Confirm, over. Say again, Coach One. Say again. I know some people probably thought that Martin Cove's character, Erickson, was a dick. He's actually not. He's a bit of a, he's a, bit of a cowboy. But he's, yeah. he's he's pro mission. But he's also he's obeying orders. But he's like, say again, like did I? Because he's confused by this. This was not. He didn't go in there with the intention, like, all right, I'm going to go through the motions. But I know what the real intention is. You can see it right here that he doesn't know that. Yeah. And he's as surprised as we are when he hears this. The guy firing off the M60. That's Murdoch's right hand man. That's Doyle yeah. is his name. The guy with the sunglasses. So I said in one of my right. earliest episodes, he's the douche. He's the dick. Yeah, he's the, he's the dick in the whole thing. I'm telling you to abort. Colonel, I've been ordered to abort before pickup. Murdoch, Murdoch, for Christ's sake, we've got him in sight. Murdoch, you read. Come on! We're going down. You're not going anywhere. Oh. Of course, Colonel Chalman's like, hey, Erickson, we're going down. I'm a full bird colonel. I'm telling you to go get that man off that ground. Right. Now you've got Doyle, who turns over, who's just finished like laying to waste, I don't know, about 30 Viet Cong. He now turns his handgun on Carl Chapman to his head and says, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. We know the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. We, now we, we, it's very clear who the uh, protagonists are. We can see it. And Martin Coe's character is, look at that look. He's like, what the hell is going on here? Yeah, and since he's flying this aircraft, I don't think he wants a gunfight in the middle of his... Aircraft no. here. We got an update. Here's one respond to our Discord chat. That's why we have. We have an update. This is from Gert. Yeah, he did mention there was a deleted scene of First Blood where that he's with a woman. So yeah, we talked about that, Gert. How I think that deleted scene does exist. Yeah, again, it was deleted maybe for a reason. So you could argue is the is it deleted scene canon? Probably not. But uh, yeah, you can find those on YouTube if people want to watch those. That he was with a prostitute. Gert, maybe you can let me know in the chat. Does the scene show him consummate the relationship, or is he just hanging out with one? We'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. You goddamn mercenaries. There's men down there! Our men! No, your men. Don't be a hero. Ooh. So that right there. So Colonel Trump was like, our men are down there. And this, yeah, Doyle character is like, no, no, your men. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's crazy to me because we know the CIA. So Murdoch, I don't know if it was said in the film per se, but in the novelization, it is described that Murdoch is CIA. That's who he's working for. So it's not necessarily part of the army institution. You know, it is a right. government, it's a government institute. It all falls under the United States government, but the CIA is its own you know organization outside of the army. And so Doyle is part of that CIA. Yeah, which they're making a statement here that it's been politicized. classic scene there and that's the scene that i would i would love to have see a painting of is when john rambo has his hand out 
Like, yeah. oh my gosh, I've done all this. I've got that prisoner of war with me. He sees his pickup. He's made it to the rendezvous. He's yelling out, don't leave. And he, can you imagine the betrayal right now that Rambo's experiencing? It just further validates the betrayal that he shows us in First Blood at the end. And here, it's almost as if he's going to give it another shot. Troutman has talked him into, you know, coming back and doing this mission. And Rambo is going to put aside what he feels, what he believes that we know from First Blood, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt and go in and try and do this mission. And what happens, he is yet again abandoned by his country and betrayed by his country. That is what this is saying to us, is that the U.S. government is abandoning their people that's what it is so it's just like he's like you can only imagine what's going through his head like they did it again i let it happen i should know better and i fell into it again do you believe at this time ramble thinks troutman has anything to do with the uh recall the helicopter no yeah i don't think he would ever think something negative like that about troutman he's the one person in this world that he trusts Agreed. There's another scene, actually. So I'm cheating, John. I, I'm not trying to lead the witness, but there's another scene coming up. I think it would be kind of a cool painting. This is coming up right here when he gets surrounded by the Viet Cong. Mm. Oh, look at that. He puts his arms out like... Now he's pissed. That's a pissed one right there. Yeah. Here, coming up on that hill. This is actually a really great shot of... Oh, sure. Look at that wide shot. Of the vehicle Amazing. coming in to uh, surround yep. Rambo and the uh, prisoner. Right here, that shot there, the way he's holding the weapon, they're coming up on him there. I, I love that look. Looks. I don't know! It should be noted too that when Rambo first met Ko, Rambo did speak. He speaks Vietnamese, plus, but they spoke. Vietnamese to each other during their exchange in the film, but the novelization actually gives you what they were saying in English. Yeah. It actually tells you what they said. Yeah, it would make sense that he had picked up Vietnamese with all the time that he was there. Yeah, he speaks it quite well, and but uh, Ko yep. told him, like, I would like to speak English to you because she wants to work on it. Right. And she actually has her degree in uh, economics as well. Hmm. There you go. So she's a smart woman. Yeah. She's smart. Yep. So we also saw during the scene here, of course, for listeners didn't see this, that Ko was in the background. Of course, she's just seen now Rabble be, uh, be caught. Right. Because she didn't leave. She stuck around to make sure he got out. Okay. I wonder if we'll see her again. We'll find out. Yeah. We're now cutting to the scene of Trauman has arrived back to home base, to the wolf stand. He's about to, of course, talk to Murdoch. And this mm-hmm. is a very interesting exchange about to happen here. We'll listen to it play out a little bit because I want to maybe discuss the politics of it after. What are you doing? Do you know what the hell you've done? Don't act so innocent, Colonel. You had your suspicions, and if you suspected then, you're sort of an accessory, aren't you? Don't ever count me with you and your scum. Look at Murdoch right away trying to gaslight Colonel Troutman. You kind of knew this wasn't a real mission. You knew. Yeah, you're part of it. You even suspected it. You're part of it. Yeah, that, talk about gaslight right away. Like, this guy's just such a dick. So you, know, you sort of knew. So there's some gaslighting right there. That's not going to work. Because Crow Trauma was like, don't you... Right away he says, don't you lump me in with you guys. I've got nothing to do with this crap. Right. It was a lie, wasn't it? Just like the whole damn war. It was a lie. What are you talking about? That camp was supposed to be empty. Rambo goes in. A decorated vet. He finds no POWs. The Congress buys it. Case closed. And if he happens to get caught, nobody knows he's alive except you and your computers. And you can reprogram that, can't you? Who the hell do you think you're talking to, Trap? So there you go. So the camp was supposed to be empty, but even if it wasn't, we could just delete the program. Exactly. Like it, like it never happened. Yeah, it's all about cover-up. Do you think your government does, or are any of our governments do this, John? Do you think our government lies to us? <laughs> do i do i paint rocky <laughs> yeah. oh my god oh well, that's weird i mean the government doesn't tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help them god okay that's weird if you're one of those people who trust the government you're on a whole you got all, all kinds of other issues to deal with we can't even talk it's <laughs> almost to the point now where it's it, it is almost comical it's like like 
No, but does yeah. anyone believe politicians? Does anyone believe yeah. anyone anymore about this stuff? I know, and pe- some people do. Like I, I, like I, I see it in some of these online things. I'm like, are you? Do you believe that? you what you're writing. Do you honestly believe that? Do you? This this government that you're sticking up for will just make you disappear in one second if they have to. What are you talking about? Reason why they have their agendas. There's one reason. I, I mean, I'll give you, it says in the film right now, but there's something that Troutman brings up. The reason why everyone's been lied to. Do you remember what the reason is? Do you want to take no. a guess what it might be? It's one word. One word, money? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's got to be. Isn't that the root of everything? Yeah. A stinking bureaucrat that's trying to cover his ass. No, not just mine, Troutman. We're talking about a nation's. Besides, it was your hero's fault. Now, if your warrior had gone in, done what the hell he was supposed to do, we'd be out of this clean and simple. He was just supposed to take pictures. Now, he says he's just supposed to take pictures. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, he actually would have taken pictures. Yeah. And when he saw, of course, we can't see this in the film because we don't get to hear the thoughts of Rambo, but in the novelization, he actually has a conversation, of course, in his thoughts that we get to read as a reader, where he says, I got proof. He's so excited. He's actually in the book. He's like, I'm so excited they're here. When he saw the prisoners in the cage, the original, he knew he couldn't take them. Right. Because they were so sickly, weak, and everything. He wanted to open up the cage and rescue them because, no, I can't. I'll let the team take care of it and come and grab them properly. Right. Then he's like, are they going to believe me? Are they even going to believe that I, I'm going to have to do the best I can to convince them? And it wasn't. And so he actually turned around to go to the extraction point to tell them, like, I saw it. And he knew that Troutman would believe him. That's when he saw the guy hanging. So in the book, too, he saw the guy hanging on that cross and took him down. So he actually didn't grab the prisoner to be a hero, but he couldn't leave him hanging up there. Yeah, right. Also, because he knew those guys have been there for years, and he was only there for six, I think he said six months. And he knows what it's like to be hanging on that cross, by the way, because that's what I painted. He also was crucified. There was no way he could leave that man now. Exactly. He had to take him down. He had to take him down. So it's a combination of him not trying to be a hero, like Murdoch says. He, he would have taken photos. But through no fault of his own, the camera got lost in the uh, air flight accident. And uh, right. and he also knew Murdoch wouldn't believe him. Those pictures showed something. They would have been lost, wouldn't they? Ah, oh, Trap, and I still don't think you understand what this is all about. Well, same as it always is. Money. In 72, we were supposed to pay the Kong four and a half billion in war reparations. We reneged. They kept the POWs. And you're doing the same thing all over again. What the hell would you do, Troutman? Pay blackmail money to ransom our own men and finance the war effort against our allies? What if some burnout POW shows up on the 6 o'clock news? What do you want to do? Start the war all over again? You want to bomb Hanoi? Want everybody screaming for armed invasion? You think somebody's going to get up on the floor of the United States Senate and ask for billions of dollars for a couple of forgotten ghosts? Men, goddammit! Men who fought for the country! That's enough! Number one, great acting by both actors. Yeah. Boy, Richard Crenna, don't give enough credit for his act. He does a great job. And Murdoch, Charles Napier, who plays Murdoch, both incredible. The way, the way they're arguing their points is you can kind of tell that Murdoch, in some ways, when he yells enough, I don't think it's not that he disagrees with Troutman. I think he kind of, like, he has his orders. It's this weird conundrum where everyone has their own orders. And I, I think even Murdoch, maybe in his own way, recognizes the corruption that even he has to carry out. The argument has validity to it as well. So are you going to give them four and a half billion dollars so that you can finance, you know, war and attacks against our ally? Like it's a very complex matter. It's not so easy. Like, well, they're meant just go get them out. There's a lot going on here. It shows you how, how messy war is, politics, all of it. It's a mess. It is. It's not very yeah. simple and clean. No. I know Troutman's trying to give it that very simple take. Like, they're men. Go get them out. Yeah. Okay. We can get them out. There's a lot that happens after that. And is it worth it for a couple of ghosts is what he's saying. You know, forgotten ghosts. Is it worth it? <sighs> tough call. There, yeah. There it is. Tough call, right? Yeah. So it is about yeah. money. You're right. But then Murdoch's right, too. Again, we... Just give money to everyone that asks for money to get our men back. Then we're financing. They're going to take that money and finance their own cause to make. Exactly. So this is a very messy situation. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to forget this conversation ever took place. You bastard. And if I were you, I'd never make the mistake of bringing this subject up again. You're the one who's making the mistake. Yeah, what mistake? 
Rambo. Yeah. Now, is this where you started here? I started uh, where he's uh, being electrocuted. Oh, you know what, John? See, look, 53. You See? Know, you know what I messed Should... up on? You know what I, you know yeah. what it was? Yeah, what? I was looking at the time to the right when there's 54 minutes oh. left. Oh, okay. So I went to minute 54. You, know, you did the right thing. You you went exactly where I told you to go, but my brain read the 5-4 to the right, thinking that's how far oh. we were into the film. But that's yeah. how much was left in the film. So that, okay, at least I know why. I'm like, why am I an idiot? <laughs> yeah, that, that's what it is. Don't do that again. <laughs> yeah, I won't. You know, I love the closing sequence there where, you, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're forgetting one thing, that's Rambo. What, you know. Yeah, that's the button they call. Without, they call that the button on a scene. Without a body, Rambo's still an issue for you, Murdoch. Yeah. So now we're kind of back to the camp. And this is a great scene because now we're going to get the introduction of the Russians. Yeah, this. Oh, oh, God. Oh, my God. Well, he is in a pit of sludge and waste covered in leeches. I would Ugh. assume this is the sewer dump. Are we assuming this yeah. is crap and urine? and? Yeah, crap, because we just saw the pigs, right, right, doing their thing, and it's being drained down into this pit is where they drain everything. So they put them in a pit of crap. Are those real leeches on Sly's body? Do you know? I don't know, but I would think not. I don't I think don't that. I don't know. They... I mean, look at them. That is a real leech. I don't call me crazy, but they look like real leeches to me. Let's well, let's watch more of this. This is a question. I see. The, these are the questions I have for Sly. If I was to ever interview yeah. him, I don't care about the rock inspiration, Sly. We've heard it. I want to hear. Was this a real leech <laughs> in your body? This is the questions I have. <laughs> well, I think they pick a couple of them off. It looks real when they come off. They cut them off. Yeah, and it bleeds. I just can't overstate enough the grossness that Sly is in. So I know what they, whatever they made to make it look like a porridge soup of yeah. urine and feces, boy, it looks it looks gross. It actually just looks gross. And you got yeah, Sly it's the actor like... hanging in this thing, and it's yeah. Okay, so he, he's in this. The prisoners of war are looking over Sly in this mucky de muck, and now we've got. Uh, some jeeps coming up, and we're going to see this from the Russians. So now we're going to see who's really in charge. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Damn, they know. Bastards. Yeah. Russian convoy, they just come out of the Russian, so this is the main Russian baddie here. So they have a vested interest, of course, in the uh, prisoner. He's dead now. And that was a prisoner saying, you know, they're watching, this is the best show these prisoners have had a long time. I mean, they, they, hate, they, hate, they hate seeing that Ramble's caught, but this is fresh meat. And the guy's like, he's dead now. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, well, <laughs> give it a second there, buddy. Give it a second. Yeah. Bring him up. Right here. Oh. Oh, God. Watch this. Yeah, he cuts it. John, if it's not a real leech, which is very possible it is not, they look real. This is 85, so yeah. no CGI. So that would mean this is a makeup puppet thing, which is very possible, but we'll just... Yeah, it's very possible. It. Yeah, no, it's possible. Not. So they pull Rambo out. He's hanging, of course, just by his arms. He's wearing a loincloth. Yeah. The Vietnamese had him a knife, and of course now we got this actor's name is Stephen Burkhoff, by the way. From Beverly Hills Cop, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, he was uh, the bad guy in Beverly Hills Cop. 
I did reach out to him for an interview on Instagram, but I think a lot of these actors just they don't respond or look at their Instagram. I try. I yeah. I'd rather use email because I think people get their emails more than Instagram messages. Because I think if you're not friends with somebody on Instagram, they don't see it. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how to get a hold of this guy, but he's still acting today. He's like 80. I would love to talk to him. He does such a great job in this film. Stephen Burkoff. So he's about to say here, yeah. these people are so vulgar in their methods. I like how he's you know, he almost yeah. feels bad for First Rambo. Though, right. Look at this horrible thing. We're, we're just going to tie you up to a mattress, box spring, and electric you. But these people, they're so vulgar. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it is kind of gross these in feces. Yeah, we like to do our electrocutions. Cool. Yeah, nice and clean. We want you dressed and clean like you can go to dinner. <laughs> and their methods. Right they here. lack compassion. I am Lieutenant Colonel Protovsky. I do not know who you are yet, but I will. Take him and clean him up. All right, so we're going to have to stop there. I know this is where you started watching. I'm sorry, but this is a whole new sequence that I have to... I think it's for the next episode. But, but yeah, because you, you, see, you see the henchman there, the big guy. Who's that guy? Uh, he's an interesting fellow. That's what I was going to talk to you well, about. Well, by all means, well, we have a little bit of extra time, so we don't have enough time to watch the scene to talk to, but, but since it is the next scene, it's a good tease for the next uh, co-host I have, but let's use it. So who is that guy, the big bodyguard guy in the back there? I don't remember his name, but he played these kind of parts back in those days. The bad guy, right? Just right. the quiet bad guy. I remember I was in Beverly Hills and I was having lunch with Sly. We were inside and there was also outside seating and you could see through the glass. And Sly is like, do you see that guy out there looking at me? I'm like, yeah. And I lean over and it was him. It was him. What? He looked different. He's got longer hair now. He's smaller. And he was kind of stalking out Sly. This was um, 2016. Wow. He had just gotten out of prison. This guy was in prison in Spain for a long time. A long time. And he is the real deal. He is one tough mother effer because they offered this guy to be released over and over if he would just denounce his religion. And he was like, F you, I'll stay here my whole life. I'm not going anywhere. And they kept him in there and he did his full time. And then he got out and he had just gotten out and was looking to plug back in. And that's why he was kind of hanging around Beverly Hills and, and trying to get to, to Sly to try to plug him back in. but. He was telling me that that guy is a beast, a beast in those days. He was really that guy you see right there. Oh, boy. Like ape-like, big. He was just like, whoo, like put his arms on the seat, like big, strong, intimidating dude. He is exactly what you see right there and insisted on realness in the scenes and real pain. Later... Right. When you get down the road here in this film and the great scene where he says, Murdoch, I'm coming for you. Oh, yeah. Right. That was originally a prop, that microphone, just a rubber prop. OK. This guy insisted on a real metal microphone to be hit with. So they had to stop. They had to go get one, bring it back. And so I was like, when I hit him with this fucking thing, he hit him. And this guy really got clocked with a true piece of metal in his head. And that's what he wanted. So that's how intense that guy was. Insane. Yeah. I love it. Is that what you wanted to share? But, I don't want to make sure. Like I, yeah, that was the thing because we, we finished lunch and we left and this guy chased us down. He chased us down and we were like trying to get in between him and so we were trying to make space and Sly's like, yeah, just let him come at this point, you know? And, and I watched them, you know, hey, I just got out and I'm oh, looking to get to him. Oh, yeah, he talked to him. Yeah, on the street. That's and he was insane. just trying to make his case. Like, I'm just trying to start over, you know? That's a great piece of information. Wow, that's the stuff. You, I'm telling you, this podcast, guys, on the Ramble, the Ramble series, this is the kind of information you get. You got Sly in real life talking to this big, burly Russian guy in real life who was years a, later. Who was a real, real tough guy nuts 
tough nuts, nuts. Like, you know, hit me with this, bang me with that, get a bat, get a real bat, like that kind of guy. That's awesome. That's why he survived in prison with no problem. He didn't care. So he would have done well in the uh, in the feces pit. Oh, he wouldn't have cared at all. <laughs> yep, it wouldn't have bothered him at all. We got a couple of comments here in our Discord before we close up. Gert says that leeches are used in healthcare in many countries, so those could have been genuine leeches. There you go. I'm not going to tell you the ass slide. I'm just saying, dot, yeah, dot, dot, if it ever crosses your mind in your normal conversations that you do have with Sly, don't do this for me, but if it comes up in your own brain, oh, yeah, Sly, I wanted to ask you, were those real yeah. leeches? I, I'm just mm-hmm. telling you right now, John, our listeners would love to know. If you could come back with me with that information, that would be huge. That's a huge get for okay. me to, to find out about the leeches. Let me see what I can find out. Okay. And uh, <laughs> a great story about, uh, uh, for my next episode, episode six, I will make sure I get, get the name of that actor. I, I, I'd love to get some... Uh, yeah, do a little research on him for your next episode because he's got uh, an interesting story, that fella. Yeah, maybe we'll get him on the show. <laughs> It'd be scary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Louise in our chat says he never realized that that was feces yeah. and other waste in that pit. It just never crossed his mind. That's the things that we do in the show, guys, is we bring up these yeah. nice little things where you're like, oh, I had no idea. John, has come to the end of our, uh, our episode. Before we close, uh, John, I would like to plug your artwork where people can find you on your socials. Sure. It's um, iconsinart.com, where I have a a huge collection of Rocky and Rambo paintings, many original that you've never seen before imagery. I have a new collection coming this fall. I have 18 new pieces teed up, ready to be released. So I have um, a, a whole new collection of Rocky and Rambo and even Paradise Alley thrown in there that uh, I will be, uh, you know, trickling out, slowly releasing throughout the fall. Don't get mad at me. I still haven't seen Paradise Alley. (gasps) Really? Yeah, for real. Oh, you know, Sly loves that movie. That's very near and dear to his heart. That's the one he wrote first before Rocky. Yeah, I I know. And it's just one of those things where, well, I mean, I can say that about a lot of, I'm I'm sure a lot of people can say that about any kind of film. It's one of those things, I'm a huge Sly guy, obviously, and fan of his film, his work. But it's just when I started becoming a fan of Rocky and Rambo, and as a kid, then I kind of just journeyed forward with Sly because I was raised with him, so to speak. He was my Hollywood hero. All those years of the 80s and 90s and, and, and forward, only a few of the films that I missed before I became a fan of them, I just never went back to. And I've done it for my podcast when I when I record uh, other episodes I do with just like standalone films where we review his films. Like I watched Lords of Flatbush for the first time reviewing for the podcast. So mm. that was the first. So Paradise Alley is on the docket. It's going to happen. It, it just hasn't happened yet. But it, it's a film that we're going to review and talk about. But it's interesting to hear that how he feels about the film. He feels like that should have been more successful than it was, sure. you know, and that is something that was really so close to him because it was the really the first thing that he wrote and directed. You know, he's funny in it. It's really quite a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale about Hell's Kitchen, New York. It's just an interesting visual of uh, what he put together in that film. So, which you'll you'll see when when you eventually watch it. We are. It's going to be. It's on our docket. And he like, sings the title song. He sings the title song. He does. I mean, he sings the opening of that movie is him singing the title. Oh my. Okay. Well, that's worth the price in gold yeah. right there. That's hilarious. Okay. Well, you bet it is. Yep. I love Sly, but Sly, leave the singing to Frank. Come on. <laughs> Who? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go see Frank in Atlantic City too. I I got tickets. I'll be there. Oh, nice. There you go. Well, there you yeah. go. Well, John, you're just, I mean, we could talk all day. I mean, the, yeah. the stories you have, the insight you have, it, it's amazing. And the support you've given my show, I do appreciate it. The John crowd oh, loves you, and we appreciate the, the support you give our show. But unfortunately, this episode is over. Whoa, 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 whoa. Nothing is over. Nothing. You just don't turn it off, Ryan. <laughs>